The numbers seem to be stabilising, so I'll start with some introductions and people can join us as we go through. Um, so my name's Charlotte Lester, I am the Policy Unit Lead at the Royal Society of Chemistry and I look after all things research landscape and economy. Um, I'm hoping you're all aware we're here today to talk about UK and Horizon Europe. We have um, colleagues here from the UK Research Office and Innovate UK, Inga, who's UPCRO's uh, Deputy Director, and Manny, who is the Head of U European and Global Partnerships at Innovate. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Um, everybody here would have attended lots of webinars um, during these interesting times. So just some basic house rules. You'll have all noticed that uh, as attendees, your microphones and cameras are disabled. Um, you are welcome to ask questions, but we ask that you do so by putting them in the chat. Um, in order to sort of keep the event flowing, we're going to deal with those questions at the end. So I'll chair a session with the speakers at the end, sort of bringing those questions together. And just to let you all know that this session is being recorded. Um, so to, to hand over to Manny now, who's going to start with our presentations. Um, he's going to take you through the UK and Horizon Europe from the perspective of um, of industry. Thank you, Manny. Thanks, Charlotte. And uh, if we go to, I would probably slip um, and skip to the next slide after this one as well. So thank you, Charlotte, for the opportunity. And uh, what Inga and I are going to try and do as a double act is in half an hour provide you with the 95 billion and growing uh, euros worth of opportunities that is available under Horizon Europe and how uh, we'd like to try and uh, support your engagement in the program going forward. So Horizon Europe is, um, I suppose, if you're counting in framework program number terms, is the ninth framework program. Uh, and I, I'm sure many of you were uh, happy to hear the news um, on sort of Christmas Eve that the UK was going to look to associate to the whole of Horizon Europe uh, as part of the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> just to put, sort of put this all into kind of context on in terms of timelines and where we are in the process. We have agreed in principle to uh, associate the whole of Horizon Europe uh, program. This is contained uh, within the trade and cooperation agreement. There are some formal steps to complete, but these are, uh, I think it's best to characterize them as rather routine steps that need to be completed. So the Horizon Europe legislation needs to be in place uh, on the European side. Uh, that needs to then be adopted into uh, the formal protocols so that the UK is associated. But there is no expectation of any complication in this process. We've been involved in the process that has led to the Horizon Europe program uh, looking the way it is and subject to there being no last minute kind of changes uh, around the substance of the program on the EU side. Uh, which no one is expecting now, given that it's all kind of been agreed amongst the member states. Uh, we know what we're signing up for, and it's just a great case of when that get that process gets formalized rather than actually um, having to worry about any sort of material steps uh, that need to be taken in terms of UK's association. And I think uh, it's worth recognizing that it's not just the UK government saying this, there are some very clear lines coming out of the European Commission itself, uh, where uh, they issued a frequently asked uh, uh, questions uh, document around UK eligibility earlier this year. Uh, Inga will talk about that uh, in the specifics of a call as well later, down, uh, later along, uh, to be very clear that the UK is eligible to participate from the very first set of calls that will be issued under Horizon Europe. So uh, I think the most important thing is to take confidence that we are uh, well on the process uh, to association and it's just a few uh, small procedural steps, none of which should detract from your ability to engage uh, in the program going forward. So if we go to the next slide, um, what does association mean? So association is, uh, to those of you who haven't kind of come across that term, uh, because we were, of course, a member state until now. It's nothing new. Uh, it's standard practice. It's existed 
uh, throughout the history of the framework programs and our counterparts in Switzerland, Norway, Israel, amongst many others, uh, already engage in the program as associate countries. So all that's effectively happened is the, as far as Horizon is concerned, UK has gone from being a member state participant in the program to an associate country uh, participant in the program. It, in effect, means that we get to participate uh, pretty much as a member state in all parts of the program. We get our funding from the European Commission. So if you're successful with a bid, the money comes from the European Commission. Uh, neither UK government nor UKRI have any role to play in that decision-making process. Uh, there is no need to validate or anything uh, a UK entity to, uh, to gain its funding uh, or uh, yeah, get, gain its funding from the Commission. All of the, the evaluation and the provision of funding is provided by uh, the European Commission. All we need to do is pay our bill into uh, the EU. Uh, to make make sure that you then get your money back. So nothing to worry about, in effect. Um, in many of the programs, you will see eligibility criteria, which refer to you have to be from a member state or an associated country. So we are eligible because of that uh, status uh, as an associate country. And UK entities as associated country entities will be able to lead projects and, and be an integral part of the consortia that... Uh, take forward uh, R&D projects on the program going forward. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this gives you the sort of the, the pillar structure that you saw before, but with some numbers associated in terms of how the 95 billion euros of funding is going to be carved up. Uh, so when Inga comes in, we're doing this slightly out of order. So Inga will cover the pillar one, which is the excellent science pillar of Horizon Europe, which attracts about 25 billion. Uh, most of what I will talk about uh, relates to Pillar 2, which is where uh, the majority of the collaborative activity under Horizon Europe takes place. And as you can see, uh, that's also the pillar that gets most of the funding uh, from Horizon Europe. Uh, and there are a number of sub-themes under Pillar 2. So there are there's a big work program around health and similarly around digital industry, etc. Uh, I won't try and go into any detail here, but in the slides that you will get from the event, there will be a little bit of a sort of a, a work program on a slide overview of each of these individual themes so that you get a flavor of the breadth of opportunities that uh, are uh, that sit under pillar two of uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, one other thing to sort of be sensitive to around these numbers is that it doesn't actually include the additional budget that comes into play uh, when countries like the UK and other associates like the Swiss uh, and the Norwegians and Israelis join the program uh, when they do. So actually 95 billion is just the EU contribution to the program and that budget will grow. Um, the other thing to be sort of aware of from a UK perspective is the money will in effect follow our participation. So there are no caps on the, on the UK participation. And if we continue to ver do very, very strongly in excellent science, so in the ERC and Marie Curie, the money from our association will, will reflect where we're getting our money out of the program. So it doesn't mean that the UK contribution is going to be split according to how the EU contribution is split. It will actually follow how the UK, or broadly follow how the UK participates in the program and how the UK benefits from the program. So in many ways, it's all about maximizing our participation across the pillars and not worrying about how the UK money is being carved up because it'll effectively follow where you are engaging in the program. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, Horizon Europe, as you can see, is quite a big and ambitious program. And it's difficult to sort of say if you're from uh, a particular sector, the only opportunities will be within one part of Horizon Europe. Particularly if you are from um, uh, the, the kind of stakeholders of the Royal Society of Chemistry, you will see a number of strategic partnerships. Often these are industry-driven partnerships in areas like batteries, clean hydrogen, around the process industries, for example, which are very relevant to the academic base and the, uh, the companies that we have uh, which are related to the chemical industries. 
So it's important to, to look across the program and across the different work programs because there will be strategic partnerships like those on batteries and bio-based industries, but there will also then be calls within individual work programs uh, that look at things like green pharmaceuticals, uh, novel uh, functional materials like graphene or nanomaterials, etc. Um, and within those, you will always find opportunities. And as with many things in a domestic uh, context, many of the programs and the, many of the calls are looking for multidisciplinary teams and, and multidisciplinary skill sets to come together. So it's important to look across the opportunities and not to just view your opportunities as narrowly focused around a, a specific part of the work program, because often they will be across a number of these. And then the final pillar, which is around the European Innovation Council, there are opportunities for breakthrough early stage technologies. So these will build on uh, often around things that may have been funded under the European Research Council. So these are new and emerging technologies. Um, so in the past, you would have seen things like graphene uh, getting funding under um, uh, what was known as the Future in Emerging Technologies Program, which is now rebranded as EIC Pathfinder. Um, and there will always be new opportunities that will come through, uh, including ones that are um, relevant to uh, RSC members uh, under the EIC Pathfinder. Those can be for academia and industry. And then there will be the kind of the scale up funding. So these are primarily aimed at supporting single companies and particularly SMEs to scale up. Uh, where you get provision of grant uh, to a single company. So that's a non-collaborative part of the program, but EOC Pathfinder and all of Pillar 2 is primarily collaborative programs. And it covers the, the TRLs or the, you know, the, the stages of research from fairly early stage basic research all the way through to commercialization and deployment uh, in markets. So it could be about things like pilot plants and demonstrators as well. Um, so it is important to look across the program. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm sure many of you can appreciate why these programs are important and why, uh, why they may be relevant for you, uh, uh, be it from uh, an academic standpoint or from an industrial standpoint. So it could be about accessing technology and capability in research groups uh, uh, across Europe and beyond. It could be about uh, developing new standards, it could be about uh, you know getting access to markets. So there are a wide range of reasons um, that might motivate you towards uh, participating in this program. And I suppose if we go to the next slide, there's nothing better than a, I suppose, having a uh, a sense of how a company uh, like Promethean Particles, which was a Nottingham University spin-out. Uh, so it's actually a spin-out from the chemical engineering department of Nottingham University uh, rather than the chemistry department, but I hope you can, uh, that doesn't uh, matter too much to, uh, to RSC members, but essentially it's a nanomaterials uh, company. They started engaging in the program uh, dating back to framework program seven, so two programs ago. Uh, and as you can see, they've not only have they worked with chemical companies uh, and a whole uh, host of research organizations across uh, Europe, but also with end users like uh, Fiat in Italy. So one of the big benefits of, of, uh, of Horizon uh, program is it brings together the entire supply chain or the research and innovation chain from basic researchers in universities all the way through to end users and markets. Uh, access to markets uh, as a result of these programs and the programs can be very very ambitious i mean you can have projects so promethean for example were involved in a 10 million euro project obviously not all the money was coming to them but it gives you a sense of the scale of ambition of the program and and some of the uh, activities under the program where they can be an integral part of a project they don't go in and start off with a 10 million project pound project uh, often they may be playing a small part in a program uh, or contributing to an element of a work program uh, within a call. Uh, but effectively, they have built up a portfolio of research projects. They've expanded as a company. They've attracted inward invest, uh, sorry, attracted investment as a result of their uh, engagement in this uh, in these programs. 
uh, and they've now got a 100 ton, uh, I'm hoping I've got that number right, uh, manufacturing facility for nanomaterials as a result of their engagement in this program uh, over the years. Uh, so if I could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so where are we now? So UK, as I said, has been engaged in Horizon programs for a number of years. And if we look at Horizon 2020, we, at a global level, we are one of the most successful countries in, uh, in terms of our participation. We're second behind Germany. However, um, a lot of our participation has fallen off, partly as a result of um, the a sort of a loss of confidence and a loss of certainty, I would argue, uh, following the referendum. And you could see industry funding has tailed off. And even if you look at academia, a lot of the funding comes from the excellent science part of the program, and perhaps not as much as we'd like to see from the collaborative parts of the program. And it isn't an either or here. So I think it is important that we retain and grow our participation in, in the excellent science and the pillar one that Inga will talk about. But it, it is also equally important to think about how do we grow our collaboration uh, in, uh, or how do we grow our participation in the collaborative parts of the program um, so that we start closing the gap uh, around that sort of pillar two and pillar three uh, levels of participation. Uh, because had it not been for um, the, the referendum, we were actually second overall in terms of industry participation um, up to 2017. So it's fallen off, and so we need to rebuild confidence, we need to rebuild our networks uh, and get re-engage uh, effectively in the collaborative parts of the program. So we go to the next slide, um, and uh, actually we could slip uh, to the next one uh, after this. Um, obviously, this is a big program, it is a complex program, and we are not uh, expecting people to be on top of all of the detail. Uh, of Horizon Europe and all its calls uh, yourselves. Uh, each of the work programs can often extend to hundreds of pages uh, and the people who know what's within them are called our national contact points. So there are national contact points for every part of Horizon Europe, um, including uh, the ERC and Marie Curie, who are not identified in this slide, but each of the elements have a national contact point and these individuals are national experts. They often come from that domain. Uh, they have a, a good knowledge, albeit um, spread across the whole of these areas. So none of these people, so someone like Stafford cannot be on top of everything to do with AI and um, uh, data as well as quantum. So they'll know a little bit about everything within their respective domains, but they are the experts who you should reach out to if you want to know about uh, know a little bit more about uh, opportunities within individual parts of the program and whether the ideas you have are fit for purpose, I suppose, or fit the scope. If we go to the next slide. Um, there are other partners within the UKRI family, which uh, again would be well placed to support you. So Innovate UK Edge has regional offices and they could help you, and they're particularly focused on SMEs, and they can help you uh, sort of look through the opportunities and understand whether these might be the right ones for you as an SME in particular um, uh, to, to engage with. The Knowledge Transfer Network has a lot of sector knowledge and sector and domain expertise and they also work often with our, uh, well sorry not often, they work with our national contact points to identify uh, potential partners be it in academia or in industry in the UK but also international partners with whom you can collaborate around specific domains. And then, of course, there is the UCRO office and Innovate UK's Brussels office, uh, which I would say is more focused on the, the policy side of the equation rather than uh, necessarily around uh, helping you navigate individual opportunities. And we work very closely with our counterparts in the devolved administrations, including the relevant innovation agencies there, like Invest Northern Ireland. So if I come to the final, I think the next one is my final slide. Uh, I think many of the ones that follow, uh, we can skip over in the interest of time. So it's, what I would emphasize is if you are interested in Horizon Europe and you see the headline of a call which you think might be relevant to you and you have something to bring to the table, um, do feel free to reach out to our national contact points and, uh, and discuss 
uh, your ideas and uh, provide them with a bit of an overview. Make sure you use our partners like the KTN and Innovate UK Edge, but also look at who has participated in these areas in the past uh, through things like Horizon 2020 or Framework 7, because there may be partners who you already know who you can connect to, uh, because ultimately the bit I'm talking about are the collaborative parts of the program. Uh, and it's thinking it's worth thinking about who you may want to work with around these agendas and where those relationships are already strong that you can build on. It's also worth thinking about some of these industrial partnerships and uh, exploring whether these are ones that you might want to invest some time and effort into so that you can help develop the priorities for EU calls going forward, uh, because it's not always about just being in uh, in responsive mode and reacting to opportunities. There are also a number of structures like these industrial partnerships, which academia as much as industry can get involved in to help shape future priorities and future calls. And that often is a good way of building your networks and uh, putting yourself in prime position uh, for, for engaging in subsequent opportunities. And then we have run a series of events in the last couple of weeks in the UK. Uh, we will be running more events in the UK uh, once association is, is formalized, but also look out for events across Europe, uh, including ones run by the, the, by the European Commission, um, to, to engage with, uh, with the opportunities and uh, potentially meet some partners, albeit virtually, uh, in, in the short term. Um, I'm going to stop at that in the interest of time. Um, and I suggest we just skip straight through to Inga's slides, but uh, the kind of overviews of the individual clusters, I think you can find uh, as part of the slide pack uh, in time. Thanks. Thank you, Mani. A lot of good advice, especially on that last slide there. I would agree with everything. Really important to find good partners for your project. Um, I will uh, move on to talking about what you can find in the so-called excellent science pillar, so the first pillar of Horizon Europe, and I will focus just on the European Research Council and the Marie Slodowska Curie Actions. The pillar also includes uh, a, a whole part around research infrastructures, but here the funding goes mainly to organizations, and then at a second level, once the funding is obtained, researchers can benefit, for example, from transnational access to research infrastructures. So, I will focus on Yasi and Marie Curie. If I could have the next slide, please. Just a few words about uh, ACPRO. So we're the UK research office. We're here jointly delivering with Innovate UK, UK Arise Brussels presence. Um, our mission, and you will appreciate that has been an interesting mission, uh, especially over the last four years, but it's really, really relevant uh, now more so than ever, is to maximize UK engagement in, in the program. And what makes us a little bit different, I suppose, is we do offer two national contact points. They're available to everyone, in particular on these two schemes that I will talk about, the European Research Council and the Marie Swodowska Curie Actions. But we also, and have done so for over 37 years, I believe, a subscription-based advisory service. And I will explain how you can access that, because many of you will have access to this and might not even know at the end of the presentation. So if I could have the next slide. So both schemes that I will talk about have a lot in common. And I guess the most important element, it is about excellent research, about the excellent researchers, principal investigators. Um, both schemes have an important emphasis on mobility, even though it's probably much stronger in the Marie Skodowska Curie actions than in the ERC, but I will explain that in more detail. And both of those schemes provide funding for individuals. So while there are also opportunities for collaborative research in both schemes, the real emphasis is on the individual researcher and supporting a researcher at different stages of their career. Uh, and there's also available some funding for training up PhDs under the Marie Swodowska Curie Actions. And the other thing that's really important is that both these schemes operate on an entirely bottom-up basis. So here it's not about finding the area in the work program that might correspond to the kind of project you want to do. It is about your ideas for a project and it can be from any field of research. 
Next slide, please. So starting with the European Research Council, you've probably all heard of this over, over time. Uh, this was a new scheme in FP7, so two framework programs ago and has since uh, become very, very famous and really appreciated um, by researchers all over Europe. Um, it offers grants for excellent principal investigators and scientific excellence is the only uh, criterion that's evalu evaluated. So you may have made some experiences with applying for collaborative research projects. Here you look at the research project, how you're implementing it, and you also evaluate it uh, against the impact your project will have and how it corresponds to EU policies. This isn't something that plays a role for the European Research Council. It is entirely about how excellent the idea for the project is and how excellent the track record of the researcher is who is asking for the funding. Again, it can be in any field of research. The principal investigator can come from anywhere in the world, but the, the limitation is that you have to be hosted in an EU or associated country, and that would include the UK. Uh, it can be a researcher of any age, but there are three different defined career stages, and depending on which stage you are in, you would apply to a specific call under one of those three stages. There are some specific requirements. You have to spend usually a minimum of 50% of your working time on the project over typically five years and 50% of your time in an EU or associated country. That's also important. And then the last point I will not go into too much detail on because they are really, really complex the restrictions that might or might not be in place on submission because it really depends when you've submitted previously under which call because these have changed over the years uh, uh, considerably. But it's something our national contract funds can advise on. And it's also, even if you've never tried in, in previous years to apply for an ERC grant, it is important for planning because you don't have to go for the first call in Horizon Europe. There will be calls every year for every one of the schemes. So it's also something where you want to think a little bit about timing, not least because there are those restrictions sometimes on the resubmission proposals. We come to the next slide. So I was just saying there's three different career stages that are considered. First of all, the starting grants. Here, the criterion is that you're an early stage researcher with two to seven years experience since you've uh, completed your PhD. You can obtain a grant for up to 1.5 million euros for a per period of five years. And then this goes up when you're considered a consolidator or, or consolidated uh, for, uh, eligible for the consolidator grants. Here, uh, a candidate has to be an excellent researcher with seven to 12 years experience after the PhD, and you can get a grant for up to 2 million euros for five years. And then finally, here it's not about how many years since your PhD. Here you have to prove you're an established research leader, and this will be done via your track record of research achievements, any age, any stage really of your career, and the grant can then be up to 2.5 million euros uh, over five years. And if you really want to kind of get a better idea of which of these brackets you fall into and what would make an excellent track record in the eyes of the, of the panels that the ERC uses to do the evaluation, then you can have a look at the ERC work program, which gives examples of the kind of things that uh, the evaluators look for or the panels look for in terms of the track record. And you can also look at examples and I come to that in in the, the, the future slide. If I can have the next slide, please. So, Mani was saying earlier, I will talk a little bit as well about the fact that the UK can participate in, in the ERC calls and why that you might ask yourself the question as to whether that's actually really possible, given that we haven't formally associated yet, but will do, is that the first health calls for the European Research Council are already open. Now, this is a little bit confusing, I will admit. And it isn't just confusing for researchers in the UK. It's confusing, I think, for everyone who uh, engages with the program a little bit. The reasons for this uh, are difficult to explain, but it has to do with the timings and the regularity of the ERC calls. So 
Um, the ERC has an annual uh, way of putting out these grant calls, and uh, they were very, they were getting very impatient with the delay um, that Horizon Europe had in being approved, and said they really need to start in order to get through all the rounds of funding calls that they are planning to put out under Horizon Europe. Hence, they've already opened the first uh, two calls. So the starting grant call is open and has a deadline next week. So if you haven't uh, thought about this yet, I would probably not recommend you do a last minute dash for this, but wait for the next year's call in that case, because it does take some time to prepare for an ERC proposal. The consolidator grant call is open with a deadline later in April. We did run some events that are also available as a recording if you're interested for both of these grant schemes. And then finally, the advanced grant call will open in May with a deadline in August. So uh, ruining everyone's summer if you're deciding to go for this particular call. But as I said, it's also, it's very predictable. So the grants will open again next year and then every single year of Horizon Europe. Moving to the next slide. And this is just an overview of how the application works because it is quite different from the rest of Horizon Europe. I won't spend too much time on this. Again, it is something our NCP can advise you on in detail, but the submission is a one-off full proposal submission. However, the ERC will evaluate your proposal in two steps. So initially, they will just look in the first phase at the synopsis of your project and your track record. And then if you pass that first stage, the full proposal will be looked at, and that's worth considering, especially in terms of how you prepare and how much time you spend on which part of the proposal. So the synopsis is really quite important, because unless you convince the panel with your synopsis, you can't make it through to the second step of the evaluation. Next slide, please. And I said earlier, how, how do you know whether you are a good candidate for the ERC or whether your track record is already there and you have a good chance of winning one of these grants, you can have a look at the ERC website. On the one hand, that will show you exactly who has won a grant in the past. I think we're coming up to an event that the Commission is organizing quite soon on 10,000 ERC grant holders. So that's a lot of successful, excellent researchers obtaining the funding. So you can imagine there's a vast database of projects and you can actually look at what you see uh, on the first picture there um, along, the, along the page are the different panels. So there's different panels that might be of interest depending on your specific area. It's probably, if you look at chemistry, it would probably be in the P, um, PS5 category, but also in other categories. And what you can also see, I don't know if it's big enough on that picture, is that really backs up that the ESC looks at all sorts of research. And it's really not about meeting EU policy objectives, because you can see we're looking from, from conspiracy theories to a greener world down to um, Christmas rituals. So it could be anything, but what is important is that it's really kind of pushing the state of the art of the scientific uh, area you work in and that it's excellent research and you have an excellent track record. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a confirmation. So it's not just me and Mani telling you today that the UK can already participate. It has been confirmed by the president of the European Research Council, Mr. Bourguignon, that the UK is specifically amongst those countries that haven't yet associated but are clearly uh, en route to uh, associating and that they can be uh, can apply on a conditional basis to these ERC calls that are already open. And all that has to happen is that the association has to be finalized before the actual grants can be signed. And there's usually a, uh, an eight month time to grant for these, for these uh, Horizon Europe projects. And so we're very confident that everything should be in place by the time you would sign your grant agreement. And this would have no impact on your application and your success uh, or your chances of success with an ERC proposal. If we move to the next slide, I also wanted to cover the Marie Swodowska Curie actions. They have a really long acronym, MSCA, which is slightly easier to pronounce than the full title. 
Um, this scheme has been around for even longer than the European Research Council, so uh, recently celebrated a 20-year anniversary. Those of you who have uh, heard about this before might be a bit confused because what they do every year, they don't really change the principles of the scheme, which are funding excellent researchers, um, supporting mobility, research mobility, um, being a bottom-up funding scheme and being open to the world and also promoting better conditions for researchers if it comes to recruitment, employment, but also in the area of diversity. But what they do every seven years when a new framework program comes is they find new names for the schemes, which is about simplification, the Commission says, but you could also argue it makes it quite hard to keep up with what the scheme is doing. So I will only focus on two of the five schemes that are offered. Uh, one is the doctoral networks that provide training for PhD students and for those of you who have been around for a little while and know a little bit about European funding, they used to be called RTNs, research training networks in FP6 and FP7 and have been called ITNs in Horizon 2020 still in the end of the day the same idea and then I will also briefly talk about the postdoctoral fellowships which used to call the individual fellowships uh, in the previous programs. So if we come to the next slide. The next slide, please. The doctoral networks, uh, this is funding not for an individual, the funding, no, to go back. If we can go. Yes, uh, the, the, the funding is provided to a consortium. So here we do come back to the idea of a collaborative research project. So organizations come together from different EU member states and associated countries and form a consortium that agrees a plan for training up researchers in a particular area of research. And so they get money for two things, basically for recruiting PhD students that are paid a salary as part of their, their time with the network and money for joint training activities for these researchers. So for example, workshops, summer schools, and all sorts of other training methods. Uh, mobility is key. So the mobility has to be undertaken by those PhD students that are recruited. So a partner cannot recruit a researcher who is already based in the country they're based in. So the idea would be a researcher could come from anywhere in the world, but would move to the country the organization in the network is based really important to the um, to the Marie Curie scheme is intersectorial or interdisciplinary um, mobility so trying out different sectors and it is also and that is what they were stressed it's it's entirely international um, the opportunities for an actual PhD student only come once the project has been selected for funding and starts that's when uh, the organization in the network would advertise PhD positions and normally you would find them on the Euraxis website, which I've provided a link to, but also organizations would advertise them more broadly. For the doctoral networks, the first call isn't open yet. It's expected in May with a deadline in November, and we will run a number of events uh, over the course of two weeks on these as part of our work as the national contact point. They aren't open yet for registration, but if you come back to our website probably in the middle of next month, then you should be able to sign up for these. They're open to anyone to attend. Next slide, please. And then we have the postdoctoral fellowships. Here we're coming back to funding for an individual researcher, in this case, a postdoc. It is a bit more defined than what I have on this slide here. There's a rule, and that is that the postdoc to have can have only a maximum of eight years since obtaining the PhD. So it's kind of for the earlier postdoc researchers, I guess. Um, mobility is again an important element. Um, and this researcher would pick a host institution in a country that this researcher isn't yet based in. So they would, for example, um, you could be as a UK researcher looking at moving, let's have a think where is it currently nice to Greece, uh, maybe you're looking for some nicer weather, to a Greek um, host institution, you would find a host there, someone who would be happy to support your fellowship, 
uh, as, a, as a, a host. And this organization would then submit the grant proposal with you writing it and your kind of idea for the project being in the proposal. You can also approach this uh, differently and say, I don't actually want to undertake any mobility, but I would really like to uh, recruit someone into my team and have support for this. And you can use it that way as well. So you can find a researcher who might be interested in joining your team for up to 24 months, which is how long these fellowships can be, 12 to 24 months. And then your institution that you're currently based in would be the host institution. Um, for, for this fellowship and would officially submit the grant. There are two ways of how this can work in terms of the mobility. There's the European fellowships, so moving between different European countries, and this will include the UK as an associated country, or it could be someone who's based in a European country who goes out, say, to, let's pick somewhere else, it's nice to New Zealand, for example, and then it would be 24 months going out and a 12-month mandatory return phase back to the European Union or an associated member state. Here, the call will open quite soon in April, so it's time to start thinking about it with a deadline in September, so it will be open for a while, but it is worth really starting early to plan for these calls. If you're worried about your eligibility for this or someone's eligibility who you would like to encourage to, to try for this, to come to you as a host, and you can check this with our NCB colleagues who can have a look at your track record, at your CV, and kind of help you with this. Because there's a number of exceptions as well, and kind of ways of, of looking at these eight years of full time research experience. And again, we will be running events at the end of April, and they will be open soon on our website. The next slide, please. This is just the contact details for our two uh, NCPs. So Mani had the slide earlier with the photos. I don't have photos, I have four really experienced and nice colleagues who work behind those uh, help desks um, and who you can contact and they form part of this wider network of national contact points that the UK has on offer for you. And the next slide, please. And then finally, I said, if you are based um, and it would probably be a university or research organization, it is quite possible that you're already a subscriber. Our subscription model at ACRO works uh, per organization and everyone in an organization then gets access to our services. So you can via the link and you will get the slides after the event, you can check whether your organization is a subscriber and then you can create a profile on the ACRO website. Why is that a good idea? Because there's a lot of information, useful information Hidden behind our website, we offer regular webinars. You can also watch recordings of webinars we've already organized, for example, on ERC and Marie Curie, but also other aspects of Horizon Europe. And we also offer a daily update service that you can or but you don't have to subscribe to, where we give you news from Brussels, news on Horizon Europe on a daily basis. Um, we also have an event coming up tomorrow that you can still register for this a tiny little mistake i've just spotted in the tweet it's the 31st of march not the 13th so it is tomorrow and you can still sign up for it and this would be my colleagues from the ncps telling you in more detail about european research council and marie skolowska curie and we also often contribute to partner events so also tomorrow if you're really interested in the consolidator grounds and i think you can still sign up there's an event run by the British Academy where two of my colleagues from the National Conduct Points will speak about the consolidated grant events. And they will be joined by a number of researchers who have successfully applied for these grants and are happy to share their experience. And I think that's it from me. So I think we move back to Charlotte for your questions. Thanks very much, Inga and Manny. Manny brilliant joining us on the camera um thank you very much for that, those really helpful and informative presentations we've had uh some questions come in during your talks and the audience are encouraged to ask further questions as as we go through we're due to finish at one o'clock um starting with the the first kind of group of questions um manny as you covered the uh process that's sort of 
still going on in terms of finalising that association, formalising that process. Um, could you just kind of clarify what that means in terms of timing, if there's any impacts on people's ability to apply? Um, and also, could you reflect on whether there are any differences between associate membership and regular membership? So I think, um, thanks, uh, Charlotte. Um, in terms of the process, I think it is a formal process, but it is a, uh, a, I best characterize it as a nod through process that needs to be completed for the UK to associate to the program. So it's, it's a little bit of procedure, but I wouldn't get too caught up in it. Uh, and I think coming back to Inga's presentation and the, the clear message that we've had on the ERC, but also the FAQ that the Commission has recently issued, do not get uh, caught up in the process. We can start building our beds, be it into the ERC as an individual researcher or into collaborative schemes as of now. Uh, the only issue on the timing is, uh, from a procedural perspective, the UK needs to be fully associated by the time the grant agreements are signed. But you're you're looking at a few months down the line, and all the expectations are we should have these formal processes completed by uh, by April, uh, May this year, probably May uh, this year. Okay. Um, in terms of is there a difference? Technically, there is a small difference. Um, so the EU can decide to make certain calls. Uh, relevant only to member states. So they can close off participation for certain activities to just the member states. So whereas we could have been guaranteed to participate in all parts of the program before, uh, that we could find ourselves with a, a handful of exclusions. But again, to emphasize, it will be a handful of exclu exclusions. They will be explicitly uh, referred to in the call documentation. So it's not something that you will need to dig into further. You will see it up front. The Commission will also have to notify us. So where we are aware of an exclusion, we will talk this through with the Commission. And where appropriate, if we don't feel it is uh, well justified, we would even be able to challenge the Commission. Thank you, Manny. Um, a third question, I think, probably more for you, because I think Inga flagged uh, the resource from a research perspective. Um, there's interest in how, how, how people seeking to participate in the programme can identify partners that have already taken part. Um, is the website that Inga highlighted apply equally to industrial partners? Sorry, I, lo I lost a bit of connection at, at one point oh, no, there. That's fine. Um, so Inga highlighted um, uh, a, a, a commission resource which hosts information about the projects. Um, we have people in the audience who are interested in working out who have been partners before. Um, does that resource also contain information about industry partners? Absolutely. So if it's the Cordis, I'm assuming Inga talked about the Cordis database, in which case it, it includes the whole gamut of uh, uh, participants in the programme, uh, from civil society entities all the way through to industry with academia, academia in between. Just, just to say, mine, mine was actually just the European Research Council one, but there is, and all these Research Council grants are then also included in that funding and tender supporting database that mine was just so for the ERC, you have a special list of all the grants on their website. So the link on my slide wouldn't bring you to that, but the, it's, it's the funding and tenders portal, and we can, we can provide the link to that as well. Fantastic. Um, we have a number of questions coming through that's about company participation, Manny, so I'll direct these at you. Um, within the provisions that SMEs are able to apply for, um, are, is there early stage development money? that SMEs will be able to apply for? So um, there's only one scheme which is uh, targeting individual SMEs, which is the EIC Accelerator. Uh, and that is for relatively later stage, um, sort of in terms of TRL development, it's about sort of deployment and demonstration type of activities. So if you're looking to sort of spin out a company from a university for the sake of example, the money isn't really there for a single company under Horizon. But for example, if you take a scheme like EIC Pathfinder, there is a lot of early stage research that's taken forward there. And there are 
these things called translational grants or uh, that are now being brought in which can help you commercialize an idea and do some of that early stage single company research but again it's worth emphasizing that a majority of the opportunities for companies are in the collaborative parts of the program rather than as individual uh, entities within the program uh, but there are these slightly later stage opportunities under the EIC accelerator as well. So Thank that's you. Um, within that collab those collaborative um, projects, is there scope for companies to host postdoctoral fellows? Sorry, Inga, did you want to come in on the postdoctoral fellows? I mean, I think it's the consortium. I mean, if you are a, if it's a collaborative project, you um, you resource it as you see fit. And if if it so happens, it's a postdoctoral fellow who will deliver a piece of work. There's no uh, no reason why not. I wasn't sure whether that might be uh, linking into the MSCA uh, query. Uh, but if it's if it's just about collaborative projects, it's fundamentally it's about how much resource you need to deliver the project uh, and and costing it appropriately rather than worrying about uh, the who per se. Thank you. Exactly, and and I guess so. A lot of the funding that you apply for in a collaborative research project go against the salaries, and the salaries can be any any type of research that you think you need to deliver the project. You do also have the Marie Curie actions have a strong kind of, uh, or, you know, they're very keen to, as I said, have this intersectorial component. And there is, for example, as part of the postdoctoral fellowships that I talked about, there's a possibility after the 24 months to extend that by six months if, you, if the fellow wants to stay with a non academic partner, for example. So there is some opportunities also in Marie Curie or uh, staying with industry partners as well as doing something with an academic partner. And that's that's also over the course of this forum has become increasingly important, I think, as part of this, this industrial experience for both the PhD students and the postdoctoral fellows. Thank you both. Um, we have a question here about how European grants are now considered. So. Um, are they will they still be considered as government aid? So I think this is a, a state aid uh, related question and probably coming into R&D tax credits. So um, EU grants are not considered state aid, but obviously the UK is no longer part of the state aid framework. Uh, there is a base consultation on the future subsidy regime. Um, and I think we'll have to await the outcome of that uh, consultation and future guidance around R&D tax credit to, to know whether there is a, a difference in how you classify your EU grant versus uh, any domestic funding uh, you may get. We do have a few questions coming in about individual eligibility. Um, I think these are probably best dealt with um, by directing people to the national contact point. So I'll make sure that those contact details are highlighted to everyone when we have our round robin after the event. Um, one more question to pick up, um, but before I ask that out to Inga and Manny, I just want to ask you to think about if there's one message you wanted people to take away from today, what would you want them to take away? Um, so will I leave you to ponder that? Um, there's a question here about whether or not there are any specific EU schemes still available to support COVID-based research. Inga, perhaps one for you? Yes, I guess we could both answer that. That's, of course, a major priority now for the European Commission. There's already been calls. And we're expecting some uh, more rapid calls to open up uh, fairly soon with the start of Horizon. And this will definitely stay a priority as well. This will also go into the partnership funding. It's a, it's a wider area, but this will definitely continue to be a priority for the different areas of Horizon. So under the health program uh, we are expecting a set of covid related calls to be issued fairly soon and i believe those covid calls might be issued in april uh, if memory serves there is also a partnership being developed around uh, pandemic preparedness uh, it's very much in the early stages of its development at this stage uh, but we are expecting something in that space to also uh, come through in the in the coming months um, and 
Under the health area, there is a, a partnership called the Innovative Health Initiative. Uh, they also issued some calls related to COVID um, during, the, during the pandemic. And again, as Inga uh, identified, we would expect some of these opportunities that are COVID specifically or more broadly about pandemic preparedness to, uh, to appear throughout the lifetime of the program. Thank you. Um, so we're just coming up to the end of the session. So um, Inga, if there's one thing you wanted the audience to take away from today, what would it be? I, I guess I said our mission is to maximize participation. It's really important. We up the participation again, or we maintain where it has stayed high. And for that, I would say you've seen we both, we could have filled more slides with the support that's available, make use of the support that's available. If you're confused where to go, you can ask any of us. We will signpost you to the right contacts and who can help you best with what, but there is a lot of support available from helping you with identifying the right area, where to look in the work program, all the way through to managing your project, making sure you don't trip up at audit. And, and so there's, there's a huge network available and, and make use of it. Um, and Manny, if you'd like to add anything to, to Inga's thoughts? I think that point on the support that's available is absolutely critical. But the second thing I would add uh, as a complement to that is that this is a huge opportunity for collaborating with the best partners in Europe and beyond. There are no limits in terms of funding drawdown. So please make, make use of these opportunities because there is no other framework which is as flexible in terms of who your consortium are. Bilateral programs are much more complicated than a multilateral program like this with a single pot of funding. There are no allocations. So it's really in all our interest to make the best use of association. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, you will receive a copy of the um, event that's been recorded um, in the next couple of days and we'll also provide you with copies of the slides. Um, within that circulation we'll also be asking you to fill out a survey. I know you get asked lots of these, lots of these sorts of responses from every event. Um, what I would do is encourage you to complete that to let us know where you'd like to know more um, and if there's anything that we've done today that hasn't worked well for you. Um, so thank you again everybody. I think it's been a really helpful event. Um, it's been great to have speakers from UCRO and Innovate come and talk to our community um, and I wish everybody a full and fruitful day.